My name is Salvatore Dac. I'm a senior scientist at Syntef Energy Research. Syntef is a research center in Norway, so presently I'm in Trondheim. And uh, the title of my presentation is Interoperability in Offshore Transmission. So what I will try to achieve with this presentation is to give a brief introduction of uh, uh, what we, we refer to as interoperability issues, especially connected to power electronics, because that's my main field of expertise. So I'll try to uh, give a glimpse of why interoperability can be very complex to handle. Uh, just a few examples of approaches that are used today for assessing interoperability, uh, knowing that in any case is still an unresolved issue. So we still have a uh, way to go before we can uh, we can address the issue in in the way that we want. And uh, I would like to stress that interoperability is a growing concern uh, between TSOs and developers. And <clears throat> On the right side of the slide, uh, let me put also the, uh, the pointer. You can see an extract from uh, the ENSOE roadmap. So ENSOE is, the, <clears throat> is an association of the uh, European TSOs, so the, the, the transmission operators. And you see that to achieve, uh, to enable large scale integration of offshore wind, uh, they uh, marked a roadmap. And part of this roadmap, at least in this middle part, it's mostly uh, referring interoperability. So how we can build a system that is interoperable and uh, avoid that this will uh, translate into possible catastrophe. So <clears throat> to, to, before I go more into the issues of interoperability, I would like to give a, a very quick reminder how uh, today, for example, an offshore wind farm is structured especially looking at the power electronics converters that are present, the other components that are in it. So if we consider a type four wind turbine, this is composed by two power electronics converters in a back-to-back -back configuration with a generator side converter that is controlling the generator. So typically this one is controlling the speed. And the other converter, the, the grid side converter, the takes care of exporting the power. So this one is synchronized to the external grid and managing the export of the power. Of course, this is a single turbine. When we move, let's say, to a wind farm, we have a layout that is more or less similar to this, of course, with, with more uh, turbines uh, on this side. So all the wind turbines are in parallel. If we have uh, quite a far distance from the shore, uh, then uh, present solution is to refer to HVDC transmission. So we will have a step up transformer here, then uh, a converter that will convert to DC, the DC cables, and then on the shore, we will convert back to AC and connect to the grid. And this is today uh, the, the, the preferred solution for uh, large offshore wind farms that are far from shore. But the perspective of tomorrow is to uh, Try to create mesh systems. Uh, there are uh, many discussions and uh, it's becoming more and more concrete. Uh, so for example, there is <clears throat> the concept of energy islands that is, uh, <clears throat> is becoming uh, uh, stronger in these last years. So uh, <clears throat> the motivation is that if we interconnect several wind farms and uh, we have multiple HVDC connections uh, into a mesh system, then we can increase the flexibility and the reliability. And this uh, eventually will lower the costs and the risks. But as you can see here, just looking at how many converters you will have, this configuration is becoming rather complex. And interoperability is slightly associated to the problems of complexity that we will have to handle. So what, uh, what is system interoperability? Why, we, 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 what is, uh, uh, let's say, causing it? The first issue is that uh, power electronics converters are very highly nonlinear and they're quite difficult to uh, characterize. So if you have a cable or a transformer, it's relatively easy to characterize because you can somehow uh, measure the impedance uh, for a wide spectrum of frequencies. And then you can identify more or less what is the behavior of it. That's not possible for power electronics because 
power converters contain a part that is software based so there are controls that are in software and this is not easy to characterize by external measurements and also uh, the, the complex behavior of power electronics converters uh, has been already proven to have risks of undesired interactions and resonances and this eventually can lead to great disturbances in the best of the cases let's say it can be uh, dysfunctions of the system and holes and these risks are not theoretical these risks are associated to events that happened in the past and can be extremely costly and then uh, looking also at uh, what are preferences on my song with Legos, uh, we should see that uh, trying to have, let's say, a modular approach like building blocks, uh, Lego building blocks that uh, will fit uh, no matter how, it's not uh, the, the point where we are today uh, about building offshore systems. So today we can design building blocks and we can try to make them uh, functionally independent, but when, when we put them in, in a system and we integrate them, we cannot guarantee today that uh, they are interoperable, so that there will be no issues uh, of operation between them. And this is a major issue. So uh, <clears throat> now, uh, if we look at a bit more into the reasons why uh, power electronics can be so susceptible of uh, interoperability issues, this scheme, it's probably one of the simplest control schemes that you can have for a power converter. And there are several uh, control blocks, but what you can observe is that several of them are cascaded. That means that uh, they act on different frequency levels. You're, we can hear you now. You hear me because I got the message that the audio was interrupted. Yeah, no, it's, it's back again. Now it's okay. So uh, we have some um, uh, components of the control system that are relatively at high frequencies, so we can have a few kilohertz. And then moving out in the in the control loops, we have the outer loops that act mostly on a few hertz. So you have a very wide range of frequencies that the control of the power converters is active. And that means that you can have also the possibility to interact with many components. So you can have interactions with cables, with transformers, you can have interaction with other converters, up to interactions with the, the generators that are in the power system. This is what makes, uh, let's say, the power electronics converter so hard to predict in this context. <clears throat> so, what, what is basically system interoperability is how we can ensure that the system will not exhibit this kind of unexpected and undesired behaviors. Because So how we can prevent that the system will not work in the way that we don't want. And also, how can we guarantee that the system will operate correctly in all possible conditions? This is also another strict requirement that we want to impose. Because if we have a fault in such an offshore system, this can be terribly expensive, and it happened in the past. Another big issue about interoperability is that testing components together, it doesn't uh, guarantee that like a kind of transitive relation, uh, the others will work together or all of them will work together. So we need to test on the full system, <clears throat> and all the possible combination of cases. So, how this can be addressed? Let's make first a big assumption. <clears throat> Let's assume that we have a perfect knowledge of the full system. So we know all the components and what is inside the components. Then in this case, uh, what we can imagine is that we construct a building model, a numerical model of the entire system, and we can then simulate it. We can we can perform a numerical simulation of it. The first issue with this is that, of course, uh, the model will be extremely complicated with very high order, especially if you consider that you may have uh, hundreds of turbines. Uh, 
and this means high computational needs for the computer, but also there is an issue about time scales, because uh, as I was uh, mentioning before, uh, the, the converters act on very different frequencies. So we need to have a time step that is small enough to reproduce the effects of the switching. So that means possibly microsecond scale for the simulation. But we need also to be able to simulate several seconds. So this in combination makes something extremely uh, demanding from the computational point of view. But let's assume that this is also fine, that we somehow manage to have a, a very uh, a strong computational resource and we can manage the, the, the simulations. The issue is what are the conditions that we're we going to simulate? Because as I <clears throat> Was trying to say is uh, the system is designed somehow to, to, to work and that means that uh, if the if the system is designed properly the cases that will not work properly are very uh, limited so it's a small percentage of the of the cases or maybe the system will always work so we are really hunting for uh, the few cases that uh, possibly may may happen and do not work and this is difficult because you need to test possibly thousands of different scenarios. And this resembles a lot the, 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 the searching a needle in a high stack. So it's, it's hunting for, for uh, the, 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 the unlucky case in, in, in a very large number of cases that will work fine. Uh, there is possibly a way of making this more effective. Uh, so research has been very active in trying to identify approaches that avoids this kind of brute force search of the wrong case. Uh, uh, this is mostly intended to do a kind of pre-screening of the configurations. So we could try to identify already uh, frequency areas where uh, the system may uh, be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, not properly behaving, or we could look for modes uh, that are uh, not uh, properly dumped. And then uh, once we identify those, we could use time domain simulations to verify them. In addition to that, there is another advantage of using these kind of methods, uh, is that when you perform a numerical simulation <clears throat> and you identify that something is going wrong, this is somehow uh, the effect of uh, the case, but doesn't give very much indications of the root cause. So using these kind of methods, uh, will help also to identify what is the root cause, so having a step forward towards the solution. And many of these methods are based on uh, small signal analysis, so it's a linearization of the system. There are a, a good number of methods today that are applicable. The one that we use mostly in our group is based on eigenvalues. So for example, uh, we uh, developed a framework to create a state space model for uh, a multi-terminal system or an offshore system, transmission system, uh, based on modules that we developed uh, independently and then put together. And uh, we create some kind of implementation in MATLAB to, to construct and to derive uh, the, the, the state-based model. And once you have that, you can perform a lot of analysis. One that we uh, found particularly indicative is based on participation factors. So this is a method that is quite well used in uh, with the state space <clears throat> eigenvalue analysis. And basically, it helps to associate the states to the modes uh, that, uh, uh, that could be problematic. So having, for example, a mode that is very poorly dumped, we could identify that this is associated, for example, of this particular resistor or this particular inductor or that specific control loop. This would give very strong indication how to solve the problem and how to fix it. In addition to that, you can also introduce, and we did it in a paper a few years ago, uh, the concept of aggregated participation factors. Uh, that means that you can associate the, the mode not to any, a specific state space uh, uh, variable, but to a subsystem. And that helps to identify uh, what are the modes that are connected to interaction. So, if you see, for example, on the right side, these are all modes, at least in a particular area of the complex plane for a multi-terminal system. And 
of these only those modes so this subset it's uh, based on interaction between systems so if there are interoperability issues they should be looked at in this set here so this already restricts somehow the searching of, of, of problems in for interoperability however the reality is a bit uh, different and actually much more complicated because most likely if we go for a multi-terminal system and a very complex system like i was showing in the picture before that would be also a multi-vendor system so the different parts will not be supplied by the same vendor by the same manufacturer but will be likely from different ones and this is a very positive aspect because we'll avoid that there is what is called vendor lock-in so you buy a system and then you're forced to buy everything else from the same supplier and this would be uh, very much uh, let's say uncompetitive but it's also very much compatible with the stepwise growth of the system so we can expect that the system will not be designed as a whole from the beginning but gradually incremented but if we go for a multi-vendor system the issue is that these vendors are in strong commercial competition between each other they're extremely cautious in protecting their intellectual properties so assuming that they will share information on their internal design of converters or components it's quite unrealistic because they would prefer to avoid any kind of sharing of information even towards third parties so not directly to the competitors but to a, a third party that could do the assessment so in this case assuming that we have full knowledge of the components of the system that was the assumption that i was doing a few slides before this is quite unrealistic and this means that interoperability becomes not only a technical issue but also a legal subject so a lot of the issues today related to interoperability are so not only of technical nature but are also related to what should be the agreements about what to share and what not between uh, different suppliers so what can we do in this case well the first thing that we could do is to share black box uh, models so uh, probably most of you are familiar with what a black box model is it's a model that functionally behave like the component but without disclosing the internal data the internal details so we could assume that the manufacturer would provide for the different components some pre-compiled and not modifiable blocks so we cannot look into what it is maybe they could be parameterized maybe not and then the idea is that we could theoretically put all of them together like we were doing for the numerical simulation case and then create a large model for the system and then execute some simulation so this would be more or less the same issues and the same advantages of before but in reality uh, it would be much more complicated because uh, first of all you need to ensure a kind of compatibility between the models that's already difficult and it's it's very difficult to debunk uh, such a model because if something doesn't work it's not a trivia to identify which black box is not behaving as it should so you will just see something that doesn't work and then it's difficult to reconstruct uh, what is the, the the part that is misbehaving so this makes things very very complicated another approach that is probably the de facto standard for uh, largest projects is uh, what is based on control replicas and algorithm loop testing the idea here is that instead of having a black box model of a component especially regarding the control systems what the manufacturer provides is basically a control cabinet so it's exactly the same that uh, that is installed in the real device but uh, let's say uh, just the control cubicle and this control cubicle then is uh, in reality is this one is is uh, uh, connected to a real-time simulator in this case this is a picture from rtbs then we perform a real-time simulation of the entire system interacting with the, the control systems of the real devices and then we try to analyze like we would do thousands of scenarios and identify 
what could be the, the possible issues. This has the highest degree of fidelity, but it's very costly to operate and to create. So, basically, we have present approaches to interoperability. They are hardly scalable and probably sustainable if we go for larger projects. Larger projects will be also more complicated, more components, there will be more risks or interactions. So if we look at it as a pure combinatoric issues, that doesn't help at all. It's a growing concern between TSOs and developers. So I mentioned NSOE is in the roadmap. There are uh, large U calls that are uh, dedicated to this specific topic. There are task forces in IEEE, in SIGRE addressing this. But we don't have a solution yet. So just to conclude, future offshore systems will be uh, grower in uh, will be growing in size and in complexity. Power electronics is dominant in these power systems, and issues of interoperability have been already experienced and needs to be carefully assessed. It's a very challenging topic because of technical aspects, but also due to the confidentiality that is involved. The present methods are very difficult to scale, so they're not sustainable for the future. And this is what requires further research and also possibly a different way of working of the main actors. And then I want just to refer to a project that we got a few months ago from the Research Council of Norway. It's three years, around 4 million euros of volume, at least for a subpart that I will manage myself. And we cover four areas, and one of them is exactly system interoperability. That's also one of the reasons I choose this as a topic for today's presentation. So I'm uh, finished with my slides. So if you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Salvatore. So again, uh, you are very skilled in uh, explaining uh, technical topics that uh, we are not always familiar with. Thank you. Um, so we can uh, wait a bit for questions, or we can have questions also later. But I, mm -hmm. I do have a, a few naive ones for you, uh, if it's OK. Um, first, you, you mentioned that um, uh, you are doing a lot of numerical simulations uh, to try to uh, understand the different scenarios and save your mode and so on. And I was wondering whether you also work on, a, um, on small scales um, physical models of the systems to validate your numerical model as well. Yes, we have. Uh, actually, in one of the past few projects, the best parts, we built uh, a multi-terminal system with the real converters, I mean, scaled ones. Uh, in the real world, you will have gigawatt of power. Uh, in our uh, uh, laboratories, we have uh, kilowatts, uh, tens of kilowatts. So we had a multi-terminal system with MMC and 60 kilowatt converters. So we did that. But in any case, you should consider that uh, when you look at interoperability, you want to have a very high fidelity model. And when you construct a prototype that is laboratory scale, then the behavior will be uh, quite different. And this is unavoidable because the scaling uh, to lower power increase more losses in percentage. And that means that the damping that the system will exhibit, it's a bit higher. So just to make it uh, very simple, uh, laboratory prototypes tends to behave better than real life because they tend to dump more oscillations since they're more lossy. Uh, okay. But of course, that helps and that helps to, 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 uh, to experiment and to, 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 to get some concept at least uh, verified in small scale before you can, uh, let's say, claim it to, to be exported for the larger system. But it, it is quite a challenging issue, the, the interoperability. So we are very far from solving it at the moment, at least in a practical and sustainable way. Okay, thank you. Um, just a, a second one. So you mentioned that um, one solution to reduce the uncertainty in the, the grid instabilities, for instance, would be to uh, access the, uh, the black box uh, that um, uh, to reduce the, uh, the effect of uh, the vendor's systems. And do you think that um, the, the fact that with um, artificial intelligence you can do some uh, reverse engineering to deduce the transfer function could be a, a break for sharing such black box from the side? 
uh, well, this has been uh, uh, has been uh, let's say considered by the manufacturers. And they they don't like it, of course, they, because they don't want uh, reverse engineering. So sometimes uh, this is a condition that is put legally that uh, the one that gets the black box should not try to reverse engineer it. Uh, but in general, it's quite difficult from a converter to, to deconstruct uh, what is behind. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, you can guess more or less what is inside, uh, but uh, not exactly. And in this specific uh, field, uh, the details uh, are what matter because that's where most of the effort of the manufacturers goes in. So more or less, I know what should be in a converter. What I don't know is exactly what it is inside. And unfortunately, interoperability is associated a lot to these small details. So uh, it, it, it's it's uh, it's a way. Uh, and and in any case, also black box model, uh, there are some issues that sometimes they're not reproducing completely. So that's why for the very largest project, you go for the replica. Uh, but that's extremely expensive. If you consider that the control cubicle can be a million of euros. So assembling a reproduction of a multi-terminal system it's already a, a let's say a multi-million euros uh, digit installation and then put the cost of operating it put the cost of uh, debugging it and so on so you can do it because it's a billion project uh, you know uh, endeavor otherwise uh, these things are crazy expensive okay okay thank you very much and and congrats for for your project that uh, you will be starting it looks very exciting yeah. If you have Not more information on the website or so on, I will be very uh, interested in looking into it.